Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's just about 11, so I'm going to start my introduction. And then as uh, as people join in, um, you won't be missing Rhoda at all. So uh, welcome to October's ISC webinar series. We're very excited to have Rhoda DeYoung here with us this morning. Uh, she works for Bioforest, um, and she is going to be discussing uh, taking stock of current management options in ongoing outbreaks for LDD ma. Uh, before we get started, I do just have a couple of introductory slides to go through. Um, okay, uh, this is the Invasive Species Center and the ISC team. And our goals at the ISC are to um, prevent the introduction spread of high-risk invasive species in Canada by connecting stakeholders with knowledge and technology. So that's what we're doing here today. And then we do have some other resources aside from our webinar series, including a best management practices database, species profiles, video resources, and also um, a bi-weekly media scan and quarterly newsletter that you can sign up for on our website and get uh, directly to your inbox. Uh, so if we just give Rhoda a second and I think she'll be ready to go. And I see we still have people uh, people coming into the, the webinar this morning. So we'll just give it a second here. Are you good to go, Rhoda? Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, I'll uh, pass over screen sharing to you and then you can take it away from here. Okay. So let's see here. How does that look to you, Mackenzie? Looks great. Excellent. Uh, I'm gonna shut my camera off as well. So I'm not, uh, nobody has to see my face while you're talking. Aww. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us today and for tuning in to hear more about LDD moth. I'm sure some of us might be a little sick of hearing about it and others of us are just starting our first year of an outbreak. So i um, hoping this is timely. Um, as Mackenzie mentioned, my name is Rhoda DeYoung. I work for Bioforest, which is part of Lalamon Plant Care. And my colleague, um, Alison Craig, also um, it's co-authored this presentation. Unfortunately for you, I will be the only one speaking today. She is delightful to listen to as well. Um, I'm very knowledgeable and, and helped uh, with uh, a lot of the information in here. So to get started, um, I'm just gonna give you a brief outline of what we plan to talk about today. Uh, I'm gonna give a bit of a background on LDD moth. We'll talk about management um, with a focus on defoliation surveys in order to plan for proper management. And then lastly, we'll talk about some tips and things that you can look at in order to get a better handle on where your invasion is going um, in your region. So um, a note before we get uh, too far into it, uh, LDD moth is what we're calling it, uh, Lymantria dispar. Um, many of you know this moth uh, by its former name, uh, gypsy moth, um, which you know is an offensive term to the Romani people, so we don't use that anymore. But unfortunately, the um, Entomological Society of America and uh, of Canada have not yet um, decided on new names. A lot of folks are calling it the LDD moth, though. So uh, throughout, I will be using that term. Um, but you'll see some of the the graphics and figures will um, uh, still use the old name because a lot of folks haven't had a chance to update their materials yet. Anyway, this is a, a moth that is familiar to many of us because it was introduced into North America in 1869. Uh, folks know the story about uh, Trouvelo, this fellow who brought the, the LDD moth over, hoping to crossbreed it in order to improve uh, silkworm larva survivorship. It didn't work. <laughs> and unfortunately, the caterpillars did escape and they try to contain it. Um, and at one time, the, the LDD moth was nearly contained to about you know, 40, 50 hectares in the States um, because they were using uh, a lot of DDT to keep it under control. And it's a good reminder that, you know, you always manage for the forest and not for one single insect pest um, because, uh, yeah, you might be able to eradicate one pest, but you've, you know, eradicated an entire forest in the meantime. Uh, so we've seen this insect in Ontario um, on and off. Um, 
in the past, uh, oh, since, since the 60s, clearly. Um, and the periodic outbreaks uh, show up every six to 10 years and last two, sometimes more than three or four years now. Uh, this is what these outbreaks look like at this point in time um, for the past 40 years. You know, we had a big peak there in the mid 80s, in the early 90s. And again, around 2002, there was also a little bit more of an outbreak in 2008 in some regions. It was really region specific. I know where I am in Hamilton, we had a bit more that, that, at that point in time. And then you'll see where we are now. Um, it'd be interesting to see what the numbers are for 2021. I would not be surprised if they're just as high or not, uh, maybe even higher, but we've seen a lot of defoliation uh, recently, more than we've seen um, in the last four years. Um, it uh, is an insect that feeds on over 300 species. Um, most preferred are red oaks and really any oaks. Um, and then, you know, others like aspen and birch and basswood can be great hosts for it as well. It has a few that it prefers not to feed on, but really it will feed on most tree species if given the chance, um, especially if its preferred host is not available. You'll see there in the top right picture um, that is a blue ash in the city of Toronto, or sorry, a blue ash. Uh, doesn't want to feed on blue ash either, um, but that's blue spruce. And uh, there's a this one little pocket in the city of Toronto where it will feed on blue spruce um, and defoliates these trees. Uh, so um, there are some areas too where it really will uh, like to feed on aspen, and you can see big populations build there but most of the time you will see it um, feeding preferentially on oak, like in the bottom picture there. These are the life stages of the LDD moth. Um, just like with the chicken and egg, I am one of those who believes in, in you know, starting with the egg. <laughs> so that's where we'll start. Um, when the eggs are laid, uh, embryonic development actually occurs pretty quickly after the eggs are laid. And so you get these teeny tiny little caterpillars that remain within those egg masses. And that's what overwinters. Um, and then when they emerge in the spring, like around May, um, they are present uh, for about five to 10 days. And it really depends on the weather. You know, if the conditions are ideal, you'll have quicker development. If they're not, you might have slower. And then um, for the second, third and fourth instar, each lasts about a week. And it's around that third and fourth instar when you really see the distinctive red and blue um, dot pattern, pat, um, pattern on the back of the LDD moth caterpillar. As well, um, that is when the caterpillar uh, begins its movement up and down the tree and you'll see it a lot more clearly. You'll see them on the trunks. Um, what this caterpillar does is it likes to feed at night. So then during the day, it'll crawl down the trunk and hide in the leaf litter. And then it comes up at night and will feed on the leaves at night. Um, this doesn't always happen when you have an immense outbreak, um, but otherwise it's a pretty distinctive behavior that you can see in these insects. Um, and then uh, the males go through five instars, the females go through six, and these can be really, really large caterpillars, especially those six instar females. They're just, they're massive. And that can last 10 to 15 days. And that's really where we see the most damage. Uh, all caterpillars do defoliate the trees, um, but it's really those later instars that have the capability to feed on a lot of plant material. And then, um, and then they uh, pupate and the females are, significantly larger than the males, as you can see in that picture there. They're a nice little brown color with these bright orange yellow hairs. Um, and just like the hairs on the caterpillar um, and later on the egg masses, as you can see on the far right, um, they're uh, urticating hairs that are uh, can cause a rash and be a, a, quite an irritant. Uh, some people can be quite allergic to them too, um, which is a good reason to never handle them with your bare hands um, and to be wary uh, if there's a strong wind and there's a lot of LDD in the area. That uh, might be what's causing uh, irritation in you or your children. Um, after they uh, pupate, um, you know, they're, they're in that stage for about 13 to 17 days. Um, the males and females will merge. The males are darker and will fly around, um, guided by the pheromones of the females. And the females are just too heavy bodied to fly and so they're flightless and you'll see their little 
you know, beautiful white wings on, um, on trunks and the males trying to, to get at them. And they're really erratic flyers. Uh, it's kind of um, almost a little bit um, creepy to see in, in the forest in, in July and August, where you see just masses of these males flying around. I don't know if you saw that this year or the, the last year. Um, but then um, after they mate, the, the females will uh, lay their egg masses, you know, between 100 and 1,000 and eggs. Um, and then they have those egg masses covered in that, that fuzzy, uh, irritating hair. Uh, so you need to be cautious around that. Um, and this is what this is the, the the time period when you'll see those different life stages. So right now we're in October, and really the only life stage we can see are the, those egg masses on the trees. Um, and it won't be until May that we'll see the larva begin to emerge, um, and they're around for the summer. And then the pupa we see in June, July, and August. Uh, right now you could see uh, pupa casings. Um, from last year, uh, still hanging on the trees, um, but they sh should be empty or they'll be dead. Uh, and then the adults are flying around July, August, sometimes very early September. But that's when you expect to see those different life stages. And that's important because, you know, management options reflect the life stage that is um, around at the time. And we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. So there are other caterpillars on the landscape that do look similar to the LDD moth. Um, both the eastern tent caterpillar and the forest tent caterpillar are capable of having outbreaks um, and feed on some similar tree species. They have different preferences. Um, the eastern tent is easy to tell apart because it does make a tent. Uh, so you'll see webbing in the, in the crotch of branches. Um, and it also has this nice creamy white stripe going down the middle. Um, and then the forest tent caterpillar is distinguished by those little footsteps in the forest on its back. I don't know if you ever remember that from early entomology class. Um, I certainly do and never will forget it. Um, and also both of these native uh, caterpillars do emerge a little bit earlier in the season. So sometimes they are present at the same time as LDD, especially those later in star forest tent. Um, but if it's uh, you know April or just at bud break and you're seeing tiny little larvae emerge, it's likely Eastern tent or forest tent at that point in time. Um, but people get them confused. <laughs> uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen like a news article that's focused all on LDD moth, but then the central picture will be of you know a bunch of forest tent caterpillars. Um, but what to look out for in in the LDD moth is that distinctive. Uh, five pairs of blue dots and six pairs of red dots. Uh, and that's what you look for. And it's very clear to see, particularly when you get third instar and, and greater. Now, where are these insects? Where are we seeing them right now? Um, I, I assume that uh, many of you folks are coming from um, you know, Southern Ontario, but uh, you could be coming from all over uh, the world. It'd be interesting to actually hear if anybody's from a far flung place where they're not really seeing very much LDD moth or just experiencing it for the first time, you can throw that in the chat. Um, but we do see LDD in populations outside of this area. Um, you'll notice this really you know, standout dot way up here near Moosonee. And that's a confirmed case in EDMAPS of, um, of an adult male that was found up there. And it's a good reminder that um, these insects can be found many places. And, and in fact, any places that people go, um, the females lay their egg masses on any hard substrate. So it could be the sidewalk, it could be a tree trunk where we often see them, but also it could be your canoe, it could be your firewood, it could be the wheel of your car. Um, and so they are traveling everywhere that we travel, um, but obviously conditions in Moosonee may be far too cold in the winter for those eggs to survive, or they may not have you know, enough trees for them to really build up in a population in that, in that area that they'd wanna feed on. Um, I, I should mention too, if you're not familiar with EDMAPS, it's a great place to track um, uh, invasive species that you see. Uh, so you can take a picture of it and note where you're, you're observing it. And then it helps just kind of give a bigger picture on where these different um, invasive uh, insects are and, and plants and uh, other species as well. 
So with that, all those areas where we are seeing it, um, that uh, leads into the areas that CFIA actually regulates for LZD moth. And so certain phytosanitary um, requirements are uh, needed in, the, in these uh, different management units. Now you'll see Quebec is one large management unit. That's not to say that LDD is expected way up north here. Um, and even you know, down here by Sudbury, we don't expect to see much LDD um, in these northern reaches of those uh, management units. And that's really because it's already reached mostly its northern extent um, in Canada. Uh, it follows the Red Oak, and you know, once you reach the northern extent of Red Oak, I don't expect to see much LDD beyond that. Um, so around like Lake Nipissing here, um, but it is throughout this region. Now, um, just because it can exist in all those areas and CFIA regulates for it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's an area where it can build up to those really high numbers where we see severe defoliation. Um, this current outbreak, this is really where we're seeing the defoliation. This is from the MNR uh, flyovers back in 2020. And this is where they saw the greatest defoliation uh, that year. Um, and you can see it's uh, Eastern Ontario, around Hamilton, London. Um, and there are noticeable blank areas around the cities and that's because they don't fly over those so there might be just as much defoliation in Toronto but because they can't uh, you know do those low flyovers in those areas we don't have um, that information from the MNR um, to know where uh, all that defoliation is and some years the MNR will actually go out and um, do some LDD moth surveys in order to predict the defoliation for the next year so in 2020, they did go out and that's where all these little red dots come. And so at all the locations where these red dots are, they expected to see more defoliation. Um, they will share these um, maps and these results on their website. So if you're really unsure for your region, what you expect to see in terms of defoliation, visit their website. Um, they usually have it up in November. So if they've done a defoliation estimate for next year, which I think they did, um, it should be up within the next couple of weeks. Um, unfortunately, yeah, I don't have it for the presentation today. Um, but you'll see, you know, every area looks like it will have severe defoliation. It's really only <laughs> right here along Lake Huron that uh, got off easy. Um, you know, lucky for the folks at Pinery Provincial Park and all their oaks there, uh, expecting lighter uh, LDD damage um, this year. So there are certain areas where, sorry, okay, no interruptions right now, please. Uh-oh, uh, someone is homesick from daycare today. <laughs> lucky me. Um, if we see areas where LDD could um, extend to, we notice that it could extend as far as those Western provinces. Um, and this is from a publication that uh, Jacques Renier and colleagues did in 2009, where they estimated where LDD could actually be seen in the coming decades um, using climatic predictions. And um, it's interesting to see how much defoliation and how many LDD moth we could expect to see. Uh, you know, in Winnipeg and throughout southern Saskatchewan. Um, but if you look at map E here, we don't actually see that right now. Um, and it's kind of a curiosity why we don't. Um, I've talked about this with a few different um, LDD researchers, and it seems that perhaps it's that they don't have that winning combination of the really right type of temperature and climate um, along with um, preferred hosts that are close enough together to really build up a population. But another thing that could be going on is that Lake Superior may be just such a really great barrier for LDD to get through and that it's not able to come up this way um, through Ontario in order to get out west. But then you say, well, well, what about down south in the States? Couldn't it come around that way? Um, they're actually doing a pretty good job of stopping LDD before it gets too far past Lake Superior. And I'll show you that right now. Um, it is kind of interesting to see what our American friends are doing. They have a multi-state approach called slow the spread. And with this, they've been working for quite some time to prevent LDD from getting further west 
faster. Um, and they've actually been able to slow the spread of LDD from about 20 kilometers a year to closer to about five kilometers a year. And what they do is they have a far edge where they're doing um, monitoring for those adults using pheromone traps. And then um, right on the near edge of um, the infestation as it's smirching further west, they do these sprays of pheromones, either on little plastic chips or droplets on tree leaves. And they completely overwhelm almost like a wall of pheromones uh, so that the adult males are just completely confused and unable to mate. Um, and then just on the inside of that and then other areas of high defoliation, they do um, sprays of insecticides. And so you can see here in the bottom left map, how far we would anticipate LDD to be at this point if they hadn't been doing um, this management, uh, and they would expect it to be, you know, further into Wisconsin or further into Minnesota, like halfway through. And really, right now, it's only halfway through um, Wisconsin, so it's not making it much past Lake Superior there. So perhaps that's part of the reason why we're not seeing LDD uh, in our western provinces. Um, now, this is an expensive approach, <laughs> and I think part of the reason why we wouldn't be doing this in Canada is that we're already kind of at the northern extent of our um, LDD um, infestation area uh, in Ontario in particular. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just extremely costly to slow the spread, and, and it will spread there eventually. So now that we've talked about bit about the background. So let's really get into the management and we'll talk about defoliation yeah, forecasts and yeah. uh, management options. Yes. Um, Hello everyone. This is my three-year-old. And um, when I was watching... Um, okay. You don't need anything right now. You can go watch your door. When, okay? I'll I, see you in a bit. when I was watching Dawa... Uh -huh. um, Here, take this. Candies. There you go. Candies when, always work. Uh, when I was watching TV, mm -hmm. um, there was a thing. Okay, I'll see you in a bit. All right, so sorry about that. So LDD defoliation surveys, um, when you're doing this, the purpose here is to really um, inform your management options. So you wanna be able to over, um, overall estimate the severity of that LDD uh, defoliation in order to uh, make predictions on the, the best management for that defoliation. It's more than just a walkthrough. A walkthrough is just giving you presence, absence, um, but these are actually fixed area plots where you're counting all the egg masses and then um, making a really well-informed uh, estimate of the defoliation risk. And what this looks like, um, what most folks will use is what's called a modified calendar plot, and that's because it was you know, created in, in the calendar region in Ontario in the 80s when we had our first big outbreaks um, in the, the, the mid or mid early 80s. And what you do is you put a 10 by 10 meter plot uh, down on the forest floor. Um, the picture here is an urban environment, um, but this is for you know woodland stands. And you'll do you know three to five plots um, per uh, per uniform forest stand, so a couple a couple of hectares. And um, and you're counting all the egg masses that are above ground. So you're going from the bottom of the trunk all the way to the canopy and trying to count every single egg mass that you see, um, which can take quite some time uh, in some of those plots. And then uh, once you have that number, you multiply it by 100. And then um, you do ground surveys where you take a one by one meter quadrat and you have it evenly spaced out uh, throughout that same plot plus one, uh, one meter quadrat that's put in a random location, just like on the map at the bottom there, or the figure at the bottom. And then you count all the egg masses there. You multiply that by a thousand. You add the two egg mass to numbers together. And that gives you this golden, you know, egg mass per hectare number. And so then you can average it, uh, you know, between your, your plots and your forest stand. Um, but then what that tells you is, um, what sort of defoliation to expect. So, you know, if you have zero egg masses, you're likely, and I'm gonna say likely, <laughs> to have no defoliation. Um, in areas where you're gonna have, you know, over 6,000 egg masses per hectare, you better watch out for your trees um, because, uh, you know, if you're having a complete um, 
defoliation, particularly of your conifers, um, those trees are not necessarily going to be able to bounce back. Um, and so it's important to really know where you are. There's going to be a difference between your management approaches when uh, defoliation is, you know, looks like it might be high, but it's only light um, compared to when it's going to be uh, severe for sure. Oh, and um, there's that picture of the egg masses up in the top corner, the darker um, uh, egg mass there is a, a new egg mass just from this year and the lighter fuzzier one is an older egg mass um, from a previous year. So you count only this year's uh, egg masses. And then once you have that information together, you can create your defoliation forecast. And this is what it looks like for a municipality. And it really gives you a sense of where you expect to experience the highest defoliation compared to the lowest and um, can help you plan for what sort of uh, management activities you want to take. Um, I can be a little bit of a stats nerd sometimes, and I really want to, you know, dig in to find out uh, answers using, you know, statistical methods. And so we actually went through this with our urban forest health team, where we had plots um, where the guys in the field did uh, the MKP, the modified cal calendar plot, plus our five tree, which is a faster version of an egg mass survey, and then what they use in the states, the USDA uh, survey. And I compared those three methods to find out if they gave us the same defoliation estimates. Uh, and they did, so that was really cool. Um, but then I took it one step further and all the guys went out in the field after defoliation in areas where no management was done to see how accurate they were. And we found that the MKP, that, that modified calendar plot that I just explained was 90% accurate. Um, so was our five tree, um, which again is like a, a faster version of the uh, MKP, allows us to cover a little bit more ground. Um, but yeah, it was actually quite exciting to see how bang on these were um, this year. And that's where I, I jump into the caveats. So there are issues with defoliation risk estimates based on um, egg mass surveys, and in fact, there are issues with all different types of survey methods for defoliation. Um, but for egg masses, one of the problems is that we don't always know the level of disease in an area. And so if there's a lot of disease, even though there was a high number of egg masses laid, we may see lower levels of defoliation than expected. Um, I'll explain the disease a little bit more uh, later on in the presentation. But um, when we have high level of disease, we'll still see defoliation from particularly those earlier instars, um, but often it will stop um, the worst of the defoliation at the very end. Um, we can also see large scale ballooning by these insects. Um, you know, they'll send out a little thread and fly off um, to greener pastures or, you know, more delicious red oaks and they can fly up to one kilometer away. And so just because you have a forest where there are zero egg masses found does not mean that you will have zero defoliation, particularly if you're at the top of a hill with some tasty looking red oaks. Um, so, I mean, overall, these egg mass surveys are really the best method that we have to uh, estimate defoliation risk, but you can use larval surveys. They really are best for just presence absence. Um, you can do FRAS surveys, but they're more of an academic exercise and not really practical for, you know, creating a good idea of what sort of management you should do, because by the time the larva is out, it's probably a little too late. Um, and then you can do a adult male trapping, but again, that's more a presence absence thing and um, doesn't work very well, particularly in levels of high uh, infestation. So this is what that defoliation can actually look like. Um, so if you remember back to um, the life cycle of the moth, um, by late May, we're already at, you know, that second or third instar. Um, and this is what the defoliation looks like. So it's barely detectable. And this is really the point when you have wanted to take some management action or are about to um, in order to prevent broad scale defoliation. But really, it's kind of tough to see. And then unfortunately, as the summer goes on, uh, by mid-June, um, I look at the sunshine on the road there. Uh, by that time, it's really too late to do something like a, a broad scale aerial spray. 
And then by late June, um, you know, it's, it's a sad picture to see how defoliated these trees are. Um, and these are otherwise quite healthy trees. Um, so if they only have one, maybe two years of defoliation, they'll likely bounce back, particularly if these homeowners who look like they cared for their, their lawns quite well um, are watering these trees and making sure that other stresses aren't um, leading to their decline. Um, so our hope is that they would um, be able to bounce back and when the, the outbreak is done, um, you know, they will continue to grow and, and, and thrive and survive. So let's talk about those management options. I've referred to a few of them already, but we'll dig a little bit deeper into what sort of options uh, you have. The first is that good old do nothing approach. Um, it saves a lot of money up front, which is great. Uh, and in most years, a lot of trees will not die and it's mostly an aesthetic nuisance. So you'll have hikers, you know, getting frass on their heads. Um, and in some years, those natural controls will be enough where you're still going to have defoliation, but maybe not so much to um, uh, have that, you know, what we saw in that very last picture there. The downsides of this are the public perception. You're, you're going to get, if you're a municipality, you're going to get calls. You know, why aren't you doing anything? Um, and some trees might die, especially if it's been multiple years of growth or if it's a conifer species. And then you still have to watch out for um, those hairs, uh, especially in areas where you have a high population um, because they can cause all those uh, reactions and rashes. Um, another thing that we don't often talk about is that people can take matters into their own hands um, and use less desirable or more um, toxic management options. Um, and, you know, my own father does this. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm sure we all know people who know a farmer or know a friend in the States. And if the city is not doing something to protect their tree, they're going to take matters into their own hands, um, which is really unfortunate. Uh, so that's another thing we have to be uh, cautious about too. Um, now, I'm going to talk about this one for a little bit because a lot of municipalities or woodlot associations or conservation authorities um, do use an aerial spray of BTK. So what is BTK? It's a bacteria, um, but it's a bacteria that's very specific to lepidopteran larvae um, in terms of how it harms them. So there are a number of different Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, th now I'm not going to be able to say it. Thuringiensis uh, strains, and the one that we use is the Kirstaki, which is specific to moths and butterflies. But there are other ones that are specific to mosquitoes, um, and it and it is about the different um, crystals or toxins that are in the different types of BTK. Um, and this toxin is specific to caterpillars. Um, which is great. So it's only when you spray it on a tree, it's really only going to harm the caterpillars that are feeding right at that moment of the spray. Um, so hopefully by then, most of your eastern tent, your forest tent caterpillars have already finished feeding, um, and really you're focusing just on the LDD that may still be present. So it's, it's used in organic farming. Um, you've probably eaten a lot of this over the course of your life without realizing it um, because it is used in a lot of agricultural practices um, and it degrades naturally in three to five days, which is why you actually have to come back and spray again. Um, and it's the most effective uh, broadcast landscape option. The big downside of it is that timing is so important for this. You want to get the timing right and you have to plan early. There are flight permits that you need and there are other you know, permits and planning that you need in order to get this right. Um, and as well, that other, you know, downside is always public perception, um, you know, which is um, understandable considering all the DDT that used to be sprayed for LDD. If people are misinformed, they're going to be concerned about what you're spraying. So you have to be really clear with um, folks what, what you're doing. Um, and like I said, timing is everything. Uh, at Bioforest, we do create these biosim maps that are free and available and always updated on our website um, that can tell you when you've had 90% larval emergence. So you watch the map to make sure that 90% of the larvae have actually emerged because you don't want to spray when they're still stuck in their little eggs. Uh, you want to wait until they're actually out and, and out there feeding. So that's when you spray and just you go to our website and you can find out for your specific area when to expect that. 
Um, and then, oops, the leaves have to be large enough at that point in time. So 30% expanded to actually have something for the BT to land on. Um, and then on that day of the spray, uh, you need to have calm winds, high humidity, good temperatures, and you don't want to have a big rain within 24 hours because it'll just wash it away. Um, so these are typically done in, uh, in the early morning. Uh, afterwards, we actually will go out and see how well um, the spray went. Um, and we look at uh, the micrograms of BT that were deposited on leaves. Anything above 20 micrograms is good. Um, and so we use this, it's called an atom testing kit in order to determine that. But you may also want to do a follow up by just visiting the forest and seeing how much defoliation uh, is out there to see how well it worked. And then you compare that with your egg mass uh, survey estimates from um, earlier. Um, and a well-timed spray can reduce uh, the amount of defoliation you expect to see by 60 to 80 percent. Um, but even if it doesn't work extremely well, if you knock back your defoliation by, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 percent, that's still a lot of tree growth that you're saving um, and, uh, and can still be quite beneficial to do. If you aren't planning on treating an entire broad scale forest, um, ground sprays are another option. Um, this is for like individual trees and homeowners can do this. They can purchase their own BT or permethrin, pyrethrin. Um, these are more um, broad scale insecticides. Um, you know, BTK would still obviously be the preferred since it's so host specific um, to do the spray or you can hire a licensed applicator. Some of the applicators you might wanna ask what they're spraying. Often it'll be BT, but you want to make sure that uh, what they're using is not something too toxic. Um, and it's nice because you just call someone up and they do the work. Um, and it's, you know, you're not climbing up in the tree, scraping egg masses off yourself. Uh, so that's beneficial. But I will say it doesn't always work that well. Uh, it's difficult to get all the way up into the canopy from the ground, especially for some of those large trees. Um, we really do get concerned about non-target impacts depending on what sort of um, insecticide they're using because any insect that may not even be feeding on that oak, if it's flying by or just resting on the leaf, it can get harmed too um, with some of those other insecticides. Um, and then you're at the mercy of environmental factors. So if it's a windy day, <laughs> that's not so great. And you're also just treating your tree. And so if the neighbors aren't all treating theirs, their caterpillars could walk up your oak after the BT has washed off and you know, still completely defoliate it later on in the season. So uh, there are pros and cons. Um, another option is tree injections. Um, and so this is using triazin, which is the same insecticide um, from the neem tree that is used to treat all the ash for emerald ash borer in the area. Um, and so you'll have a licensed applicator come out, they'll inject the tree, um, and then the triazin goes through the conductive tissues of the tree and uh, is in the leaves. So that way when the caterpillars start feeding on the leaves, they're unable to molt and they die. Um, you have a little bit more flexibility in timing um, because you don't have to wait for the weather to be just right, but you do wanna do it you know, right when those early larvae are emerging. Um, and it offers control until the end of the season. It degrades naturally in the leaves before they fall, so you don't have to worry about any sort of insecticide left in the leaves at the end of the season. Um, and uh, yeah, you're just calling someone, so it's not a lot of effort. But uh, the cons are that it does require a licensed applicator, so it's not something a homeowner can just do. And if you're a municipality and you've got a big wood lot and you don't want to do an aerial spray, it would be a ton of work to inject you know, a couple hectares of trees. So uh, that's a downside. It is effective though. Um, we did a study and, and this is you know, going all the way back to 2004 um, in Wisconsin and we've done studies in Ontario as well um, to see how well uh, uh, this works both in the spring and in the fall. And actually in the States, we will have trees injected with triazin in the fall. Um, because the spring is a really busy time and often we'll see that treatments for LDD moth don't work because uh, people were busy with many, many other things that they're doing in tree care uh, right in the spring. And so if you can go out and do your egg mass surveys in early November and inject your trees right away um, for control the next spring, uh, you save yourself some time. But uh, that's, that's only unfortunately for in the States, um, but it does work well. Um, tree banding is something that uh, Taylor Scar has said before. 
makes you feel good. <laughs> um, it's something that you can do where you're really involved and invested in the process of removing those caterpillars. Um, but uh, yeah, the results are hit and miss. Um, what you do is uh, with the burlap, you'll wrap it around the tree and you fold it over. And then when those larvae are crawling up the tree uh, in the early morning, or sorry, in the early afternoon to get up into the canopy at night, uh, they get stuck. And so then you come and you remove them and you put them in a bucket of soapy water. Um, some folks will use like a sticky product, like Tanglefoot. Um, I caution that um, because I have seen way too many pictures of birds stuck on those, you know, when they're trying to come to get the caterpillars or the other insects that are stuck on there, they get stuck too. And it's the saddest thing in the world. So um, most folks recommend some sort of barrier around that. And, but even then it's, it's not uh, foolproof. Um, I haven't honestly used this bug barrier tree band, but I like the idea of it where it's actually like a gauze that goes around. Um, and so the caterpillars get stuck in the gauze and then there's another sort of uh, sticky sheet around it that, you know, if a bird's coming to the tree, it's not gonna get stuck on it. And then um, it's less likely that you're gonna need to come and collect the caterpillars every single day. Um, so tree banding by itself, it, it, it's beneficial because, you know, once you see the caterpillars up there, that's when you can start. Um, but uh, improper banding is common and it, it's not always effective. Um, caterpillars can make their way around it, especially if the canopies are connected or it's a high outbreak and they're not really coming down the tree during the day. Uh, so you can still see a lot of defoliation and it's a lot of work um, to remove all of those larvae every day. Um, so you could get ahead of the game and do egg removals. Um, I recommend that folks start this after November uh, and that's specifically because there's a, a parasitic wasp that will feed on the egg masses and it completes its development by, the, uh, by November. And so um, you want to make sure you're not accidentally removing an egg mass that's actually full of parasitoids that are going to help you. Uh, so wait and use this as you know, your nice wintertime activity. Um, it's another activity that, that Taylor Scar will say makes you feel good um, <laughs> because it's a lot of work. Um, but uh, it may not be incredibly effective, especially if you're missing a lot of those uh, egg masses. Um, back in the day, they'd always recommend to uh, scrape those egg masses off into a bucket of Creo soaped. <laughs> we recommend just soapy water for 48 hours. Um, and make sure that you're catching all of those egg masses, um, because if you accidentally let them fall into the leaf litter, and then they get a nice layer of snow on them. You just set them up for, you know, lovely overwintering and they'll have um, improved survivorship for the next year. So make sure you get them all. Um, so in terms of timing, um, this is a really handy graphic from the city of London um, where uh, you can see Mom. that your management needs to be scheduled based on the life cycle Mom. of the LDD. Yes. Can I watch Minions? Yeah, you can watch Minions. Okay, keep watching what you're watching, okay? Here, have a granola bar. Sorry. Um, can I watch Minions? Yes, you can watch Minions. Okay, press play. Can you press play? <sighs> okay, uh, so right now you can do those egg mass surveys. It's easier to do once the leaves are off. Um, and then after that, your next big management option will be uh, egg mass removal. If you can if you've got time and then um, during that early caterpillar stage uh, you do burlap banding uh, pupil stage you can remove uh, hand picking um, but then your your treatment by any sort of insecticide needs to happen during that early um, instar um, uh, caterpillar stage may and june and this is just another way of looking at it and here they actually even suggest don't even bother with the adult uh, moths so um, uh, so we'll talk briefly about the biological controls, and then we'll talk about where we're going with this invasion. So um, there is a fungus that's an entomopathic fun fungus that will kill LDD moth. And this is a great thing to look out for. Um, you'll see the larvae are dead and brittle on the trees with their head facing downward. And then the big one that we want to look out for is NPV. Um, and you'll see the distinctive in inverted V shape here. 
Um, and this virus is, um, you know, 90% effective, um, and we'll see it actually in two waves when it comes out. First, the larva will emerge out of their egg masses and get covered with it, um, and then uh, they will die, and then all of their uh, fruiting bodies will um, come out of those early instar larvae, and then they'll infect uh, later instar larvae um, that hadn't been infected previously. And so that's why you can still get a lot of defoliation in a year where the MPV does its work, but um, you will kill a lot of caterpillars this way. There are a lot of um, different parasitoid or uh, predators of um, the egg masses and the pupa, um, but there are also uh, uh, a, a, a parasitic wasp. And uh, this parasit wasp, like I said, um, is around from August to November. Um, but on moderate years or light years, uh, where you don't have a heavy infestation, it's the mice that are really doing a lot of the work to control the gypsy moth, um, as well as a few other uh, animals. So let's talk about our invasion uh, trajectory. Um, when will this current outbreak end? <laughs> It'll be very region specific, um, as you might uh, anticipate. So watch your area for winter temperatures where you have extended period of minus 20 uh, with no snow in particular, um, because otherwise those egg masses on the ground, they're nicely protected under a blanket. They can continue to survive. Look for evidence of the mimega, the dead brittle um, caterpillars on the trunk and the MPV, the inverted V. Um, and um, yeah, when parasitoids have had a chance to build up to high populations, when you've had you know, previous years of outbreak, they can help uh, make the population crash. Another thing that we often look out for when we're doing egg mass surveys is the size of the egg mass. So if it's less than 25 millimeters, so more the size of a quarter as opposed to a two meat, um, then that can be an indicative that the, the, the population is collapsing. Um, and you're really unlikely to see more than three to four years of infestation in an area. Um, you know, there's competition from, you know, let's say there's a forest tent caterpillar outbreak. Um, they, may, uh, they may feed on all of the leaves um, prior to the LDD coming out. And so they might compete over out compete them. Um, or you may have a really nice, warm, wet spring that's really beneficial for Mimega or NPV. And um, that may um, increase the likelihood that they are going to help control uh, the insect as well. So, not sure what to do? Consult your magic eight ball. <laughs> no, really, think about your management objectives. That's always the first thing to think about. What is your objective in managing for LDD? Um, at this point, it's certainly not to eradicate the insect, um, but think about how much defoliation you feel comfortable with. Um, is it 25%, 50%, or are you really just trying to reduce citizen complaints and you're not too concerned about the trees? Think about those objectives. Um, so if last year was your first outbreak year, expect another outbreak year. You are just fine. Can you um, sit tight for another five minutes, please? Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, and then count your egg masses uh, without, you know, looking out and doing those defoliation risk estimates. You're really not going to have a sense of what you're going to be able to do. And then, of course, go out, watch the weather look for MPV, Mimega, that's really gonna inform you um, whether you're gonna see an outbreak or not. And we do see MPV all the time. So it's not like a presence absence thing. What you wanna do is look for you know, it everywhere on every tree um, in high numbers um, because that's when it's really gonna have an impact on the population. Um, and lastly, whatever your approach, make sure you're communicating to your constituents. Um, and that's going to save you a lot of headaches because I find that with a lot of folks that we work with, uh, that's going to be the, the biggest problem that they have with LDD. It's not the defoliation or, you know, a few dead trees or a lot of dead trees. It's really all the time and energy spent um, working to make sure that everybody knows what they're doing, why they're doing it, and um, that they're actually doing something to make sure that these um, trees are, are not left uh, simply to their own devices. 
So with that, I will open it up to questions. Um, if you are you know, shy and you'd rather ask me a question directly after, please feel free to email me or my colleague, uh, Alison Craig. Um, are happy to chat about things further. Um, but uh, otherwise, for those who are, are brave, uh, feel free to um, yeah, address me with any of your questions. Mackenzie? I was on mute, sorry. Oh. Uh, I was just <laughs> no. saying you were being a rock star today with your scientist and mom hat on. So we thank you so much for spending your time with us this morning. And we do have a few questions that came in, so I can just go through those quickly. Go for it. Um, a question from Catherine. Does treason harm other non-target native insects? Um, well, we use treason to control for EAB, um, so it does harm other insects, but the goal is that you are um, addressing a specific tree where you know what the specific pest is on that tree. So any Lepidopteran that is feeding on that oak tree will feed, not be able to molt, and will die. So if there are other Leps, for example, that are feeding on the oak tree, they're going to die too. Um, and so just like with BT, we're going to see incidental impacts on, you know, something like a forest tent caterpillar or um, an eastern tent caterpillar that's doing the same feeding. And it's really difficult to avoid that. The only treatment that's really very, very specific to LDD moth is the NPV um, virus. And um, I wish I could say that it would be really easy to grind up the NPV and spread it around, but, um, you know, Folks have done that, uh, including the Canadian Forest Service, but it's about 500 times more expensive. So it's just uh, unfortunately uh, not an easy approach for us to take, um, even though I wish it was. Good question. Okay, next question is from Ryan. Um, how long do the stressed oak trees take to recover from severe defoliation? Uh, that's a good question, because one thing I didn't really address is, all the other stresses that might be um, harming your oak at this point. Um, so a lot of trees will be fine with, you know, 40% defoliation um, for, you know, a year or two. Um, but if they have other stresses, like maybe your neighbor just put it in a brand new driveway and they hurt some of your roots, or maybe it's um, a drought um, or you have oak wilt in the area, which is my biggest concern. My biggest concern is that we're going to have LDD come through and then all these trees are going to be really stressed and oak wilt's just going to take advantage. Um, but you have to think about all the other stresses that are there. So if you're concerned about your specific tree, one thing you can do for it is, is water it. Um, make sure, well, maybe not this year, it's probably a little bit overwatered, but make sure that it's watered and that it has what it needs in order to bounce back. Um, so limit as many of the other stresses as you possibly can. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. Um, there was another question about the NPV virus, but you already answered it, that it's specific to LDD moth. Yes, yeah. Um, and then does spraying BTK or using other control methods inhibit the chance of natural population controls developing such as viruses or parasitism? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think, um, uh, Taylor was asked this question last year too. He, uh, Taylor Scar and David uh, Duckwitz um, from ISC had also done a, a, just a wonderful presentation on LDD last year as well. Um, and this, this comes up all the time because you want to make sure that you're not inhibiting MPV from doing its work. Um, what I like to think about is that map early on where I showed the areas of defoliation and the amount of area where LDD is present is so expansive that even if you are a municipality spraying, you know, like even a couple hundred hectares or you know, maybe not a couple hundred, but like a, a large area, um, it's a drop in the bucket. And so uh, you wouldn't have to worry that you're inhibiting MPV. And in fact, you're probably not going to do too much to uh, limit the defoliation the next year as well, um, just because it's just so present uh, throughout the forest. Okay, I think that was all of the questions. There were a couple of comments, so I can share those with you after, Rhoda. Um, just wonderful presentation. Um, and then the presentation will be shared on our YouTube channel um, after we're done here today. 
Um, and then, so after, if you have colleagues that would like to watch Rhoda's presentation at a later date, um, it will be on our YouTube channel. And then I just have a couple, while well, we have a still couple of minutes, I have a couple of just comments um, about LDD Mon. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to try to get my slides shared again. Bear with me for a moment. Oh. Uh, uh. Hello. Okay. That works. I can see them. Okay. So I just wanted to share on the topic of LDD moth. Um, the ISC is running again this year our LDD moth egg scraping contest. So last year was the first year that we ran this event, and we had 12,000 egg masses scraped um, throughout the province. Uh, our goal was 500, so we beat that by a little bit. Uh, so we're hoping to beat last year's 12,000 this year. So this contest is going to be opening um, in the next week or so. So stay tuned for more information. But just because we have related content here, I thought this would be a good opportunity to promote that. Um, and then I will, before we go, um, just share um, our next month's webinar series uh, presentation which will be on the trials, tribulations, and toolbox of an invasive plant management practitioner. Uh, so stay tuned for that one on November 24th. Um, and if, if that's all, there's no more questions, I think we can wrap up for today. And thank you so much, Rhoda, again, for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you. This is fun, even though, you know, my three-year-old made too many cameras. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, you did great. Necessary distractions. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks, Rena. Okay, bye. Take care.